Hey, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so um, okay, just a show of hands first. How many of you have heard of Bitcoin? Okay, how many have heard of Ethereum? Okay, Polygon? Okay, that's just a sensing of uh, the, the room and how much pre how much pre you guys know first. Okay, so the slides are available here. There's some clickable links uh, to more resources. So that's why I'm giving you the slides so you can explore if you're interested. Um, yeah, so here's an overview of what I'll talk about today. Um, although I think you guys roughly know what Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is about, I'll still go through a few basics of the technology, of blockchain technology, and then I'll move on to decentralized finance, how, how the blockchain technology is applied to finance, because this will form the foundation for how, um, how, we, how we explain how to extract value from these uh, decentralized finance applications. So after that, I'll talk a bit about the social and economic aspects of this also. Okay, so blockchain technology is actually more general than cryptocurrency. Like blockchain technology is, is a technology as applications outside of just decentralized finance also. So blockchain technology is a way to reach distributed consensus in such a way that you do not need to trust a single centralized entity. So there's a great two, three blue one brown video explaining proof of work and proof of work is the blockchain technology behind Bitcoin. So Roughly speaking, what it is is Bitcoin is a distributed ledger, which means that the ledger stores how much each account has amount of Bitcoin, like how much each money each person has. So it's a distributed ledger and how you maintain um, immutability, how you make sure that somebody cannot go back in time and rewrite history is that, you, is that the previous hash is included in the next block. So it's, it's, a, it's a chain of hashes, a chain, chain of, it's a chain of blocks and um, and if, so if you try to change the data in one of the blocks, you need to recalculate the hashes of all the future blocks. So that's how this, this chain of blocks is how uh, you ensure that somebody cannot like, modify the past without needing to recalculate everything. So it's a distributed ledger made out of a, uh, a block of chains and uh, sorry, a chain of blocks and each block contains a list of transactions. So, um, so the blockchain would be updated one block at a time. And how you update one block is, uh, how you update one block is, if I have a block X, the Bitcoin miners, which is a lot of people, they'll all race and compete with each other to find a, a string Y such that hash of X plus Y ends with some zeros. And because the probability of finding such a Y is very low, and the hash function is a one-way function, right? You cannot, you cannot easily undo the hash function. The only way these miners can find the Y is by brute force. And they require a lot of computing power to find this y. But the, the thing about this is that once such a value y is found, anyone else can easily verify it. So to construct a block is very computationally intensive. But once you have found once you have found such a y, anyone else in the world can verify it in, in an instance. So this way, um, so so the first person who finds the first miner who finds such a y would would, would, would be said to have mined the block successfully and they earn a small reward for doing so. And this forms a block in the blockchain. So the idea is that, um, okay, so the, the, the correct state of the ledger, how people can reach distributed consensus on how, on, on what led, what's the correct state of the ledger is, is they can, they, they look at the longest blockchain. So because they look at the long, longest blockchain, the idea is that um, nobody can manip manipulate the ledger provided computing power is evenly distributed. Because if you want to be able to grow the, if you want to be able to grow the blockchain to be the longest, right, you need to basically out-compute um, like half of the world's computing power. So, so that's the premise of Bitcoin. Um, I think you guys are more or less familiar with it, probably, uh, but this is just a recap. So this comes with obvious uh, limitations because it's a big waste of energy and basically a small country's worth of energy and computing power is wasted on just generating these useless uh, shrinks Y. Um, yeah, the Y is also called a nonce sometimes. And also another big red flag of Bitcoin is that um, because finding such a Y is very computationally intensive, if you try to run, if, even if you run your own GPU, right, chances of you finding that, ch chances of you m successfully mining a block is very, very low. So if you buy a $4,000 GPU and then you run it for like 10 years, maybe you'll find one block and then you earn, okay, maybe the block reward is very big. But the idea is that um, the, the reward isn't consistent for you because you, you, you put some investment and purely based on luck, right? You need to wait for a very long time 
before you, you can actually get your first reward. So that leads to the idea of that leads to the idea of mining pools where if you have a GPU, instead of trying to mine the block yourself and waiting for the low probability but high reward, right, instead of doing that, you join a mining pool and then you, you team together with a bunch of other people and you tell them, okay, we all we all try uh, to mine the block, but if any one of us gets the block, right, if any one of us mines the block successfully, we all share the reward. So this way you, you spread out your, your reward. Um, so instead of earning Instead of earning, let's say, ten thousand dollars in ten years, you earn one thousand dollars in one year. So, so, uh, so that's that's a coin of mining pools because that, that's a coin of Bitcoin because mining pools actually lead to centralization, right? In fact, at one point in time, so the whole idea of Bitcoin originally was that if computing power is evenly distributed, nobody can manipulate the ledger. But what happens is that people pool together and there's a pool manager, and the pool manager essentially controls. All these mining pools. So there's one point in time actually a mining pool got big enough to actually carry a 51% attack and, and of course they didn't do it but people were very concerned and they had to like tell people okay we'll, we'll split up our mining resources um, and basically Bitcoin has proof of work has a few limitations okay, so that led to the idea of proof of stake. So instead of having miners which use computing power to mine the blocks now stakers will stake money instead so they'll deposit some amount of money in some trusted uh, area some vault and there's a few there's a few implementations differing from chain to chain, but the rough idea is that uh, for for each block, in order to generate each block, instead of miners racing to form the block, you actually randomly select a staker, and the staker will propose a block, and other people will vote whether it's correct or not. And the idea is that um, it will be accepted if it's a majority vote. And if anybody tries to misbehave, right, because they have put money in this vault, you can confiscate it from them. So this this incentivizes malicious behavior. So this is a lot more energy efficient. Uh, there's still some problems with it, which I'll talk about soon. So that's the basics of the two main uh, consensus, distributed consensus mechanisms. Um, yeah. So there are other. There's a lot of others also, and a lot of other blockchains that are based on these different technologies. And zero knowledge proofs is also an uprising uh, topic in research. So okay. So there's idea of layer two. Sometimes you might hear it being mentioned, uh, and the idea is that uh, so. We have Ethereum, which is proof of currently proof of stake. Right? Ethereum is is one of the more popular chains. And if let's say somebody somebody else wants to start their own blockchain, but they they do not want to like completely be separate from Ethereum, they kind of want to sync up with the Ethereum blockchain. What they can do is they can say that okay, we run our own chain, like Polygon is a layer two. So you have your Ethereum main chain, right? And then the Polygon is like, okay, we run our own blockchain. Um, but we'll sync it out of Ethereum. So like every every once in a while we'll bundle our transactions and send it to Ethereum so we can sync up the accounting. And the benefit of this is that Ethereum itself is faster than Bitcoin, but Ethereum is still quite slow. Uh, and layer two solutions are a way to help Ethereum scale. Um, yeah, help Ethereum scale better. Okay, so, uh, so help Ethereum scale better while also maintaining some form of legitimacy based on Ethereum because Ethereum is, is more well established. So with that, that leads to the idea of smart contracts. So Bitcoin is just a distributed ledger. Not, not, uh, I mean, you can use it to say who has how much money, but not very, very useful. Um, but with Ethereum, you can actually upload code on the blockchain. So you can run code on the blockchain, and that leads to decentralized applications. So what is, how, 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 how does code on the blockchain differ from your normal like, web server and stuff, your normal websites? Um, it differs in a few ways. Number one, the data, right? Usually data in some data center, you, nobody else can access it. But on the blockchain, the data is publicly accessible. So you can kind of think of it as anyone can see the, the data. And the data is usually on the form of some dictionary. So like, like, yeah, it's really just like a dictionary in Python or like a map in C++. Um, your actions, your, your functions is similar to AWS Lambda, right? You can, you, can call, you can make a function call to the blockchain to operate on the data. So you can modify the data, um, yeah. And, and, you can, and each function call also has certain permissions, similar to AWS Lambda, right? You, you do not want anybody to call any function. So you can restrict who can call certain functions. And with that, that actually leads to uh, some, some applications with, with this idea. One application of it is the ERC20 token. So uh, if, if, I bring, if I come over here, what an ERC20 token is, 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 a, is a smart, 
it, if you want to create your own ERC20 token, right, your own, your own uh, cryptocurrency that's built on the Ethereum blockchain, what you do is you implement the ERC20 interface. So it's like a Java interface. A Java interface meaning it, it, it lists a certain set of functions that you need to implement in order to call yourself an ERC20 token. So if I, if I come over here and show you the code. Okay, so over here you can see that you have an interface. I, I stands for interface and then I ERC20. Right, so this, uh, this, the, this, this, program, this programming language is called Solidity. And you can see that the interface contains a bunch of functions like the, if you want to implement your own token, then you must implement the total supply function. You must implement the transfer function. You must, um, yeah, you must, imply, you must implement the transfer from function and, and so on. So if, if, you, if you implement these functions, if you extend this interface and implement these functions, then you can call your own, your, you can call your token an ERC20 token, right? Uh, and let's say after you have your own token, you want to list it on a decentralized exchange Uniswap, which I'll talk about more, more later. But similar idea, the Uniswap V2 pair, V2 is just a version of Uniswap. Uh, Uniswap is the name of the decentralized exchange. And pair is just indicating that you have, a, you have a pair of assets that you want to trade between. So if I open the Uniswap V2 pair, you can see the interface is also similar, right? Interface I Uniswap V2 pair. And inside that, you have a bunch of functions that you need to implement if you want to list your coin on the decentralized exchange. So in this case, I need to implement, once again, the transfer function. I need to implement uh, balance of function. I need to impl implement um, swap function, right? So I need to implement the, the, the swap function, which tells you how the swap to, okay, the swap is down here, which tells you how to swap two assets. So, yeah. So the idea is that as long as you implement, as long as you implement these functions, you can, you, you essentially listed your, your cryptocurrency on the exchange. So often you hear all the different coins, right? And so, so some of, some of the, that there's, a, that there's a distinction between a coin that is native to the blockchain. So for example, for Ethereum blockchain, there is Ether, right, as the cryptocurrency. And then for Polygon blockchain, there is Matic as the cryptocurrency. But there's a difference between Ethereum and, and Matic, this, this class of uh, cryptocurrencies, versus, let's say, your standard meme coin, like Shiba Inu, right? So if the Shiba Inu meme, meme coin is an ERC20 token that's built on the Ethereum blockchain, whereas your Ether cryptocurrency is native to the Ethereum blockchain itself. So um, with smart contracts, uh, you, can, you can build cryptocurrencies on some existing blockchain. And, and yeah, I just wanted to make the distinction between these two types of cryptocurrencies. So. Okay, so something you notice is that you, can imp you just need to implement these functions to call yourself a cryptocurrency or to list it on an exchange. But how you implement it is completely up to you. So that's actually the idea behind honeypots. Essentially, honeypots, they create an ERC20 token, they create a Uniswap V2 pair, list it on some exchange. But how they actually implement the transfer from function is that they say you can only buy it, but you cannot sell. So, so yeah, so, so how you design your own cryptocurrency, your, your cryptocurrency can implement these standards, right? It, it just needs to match the function name and the parameters. But how you exactly implement the logic is up to each author as well. Okay, so, uh, so the last concept I'd like to go through is the idea of mempool. So I think when you, when you if those of you who have uh, played with like cryptocurrency before, you know you open MetaMask, right? And then you send, you send a transaction to the blockchain and then you open Etherscan and then you refresh, refresh, refresh. And after that you see, eh, oh, my transaction succeeded. Uh, but what actually goes on behind the scenes is that when you op when you click send on Ether, uh, wait, when you click send on MetaMask, it actually sends to a it actually sends to a URL, and that URL would send your transaction to basically all the validators, everyone in the world, and and all the validators they have a mempool. Each each, each validators mempool is also different. So when you send your transaction, it actually gets sent to a waiting room of a bunch of other transactions and. The, and, and the reason why I mention this is because when you send your transaction to a mempool, to a waiting room, that doesn't mean that it's been processed yet. And what happens in arbitrage is that when you send it to a mempool, uh, people who are running the mempool, people who are running their own mempool, they can see your transaction and they see that it's profitable to sandwich or front run your transaction, they can do it. So how, how you, the first step of being an arbitrager, an uh, uh, MEV searcher, is that you run your own mempool so you can collect all the transactions. Um, and then from, from there, you can process the data according to how you want. So 
there's a nice website over here where they illustrate how the Bitcoin mempool looks like. So, so on the right over here, we have blocks that have been already mined. Okay, and on the left over here, we see that we have the next block that's going to be mined. And uh, I bring this up because I want to mention something important, which is the idea of gas fee or transaction fee. So every time you send a transaction, you must send a bit of gas with it also. If you know, we play with MetaMask, you know that it must indicate how much gas you want to send. Um, and each time you send your transaction to a mempool, the mempool operator would arrange the, they can arrange the transaction, the person who builds the block can arrange the transaction in any order they want. But chances are they're going to arrange it by increasing gas fee. So they, they will want to process the, 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 the higher transaction fee transactions first because they want to earn more money. So you see all the way to the top right in color in red over here, there's, a, there's one that is offering a fee of uh, 30, $36. And down here, it's like 90 cents. So the idea is just that, the idea of this is just that um, you, you, each transaction has a certain gas fee associated with it. And the people who are mining the transactions, who are building the blocks, they actually sort it based on this gas fee. And so this leads to front running because, this leads to front running because um, what happens is you might make a transaction and the person operating the mempool, they might, or, or rather, somebody operating a mempool, they might see your transaction, and if they see that it's profitable, they will front, they will front run you and copy your transaction, and they will send it with a higher gas fee, so it gets processed first. So this, this, uh, there's a nice paradigm article over here talking about how Ethereum is a dark forest, which, um, yeah, so how Ethereum is a dark forest, where it basically talks about a story, a very interesting story about how some people found a vulnerability in a smart contract, and they could and, and they could allow anyone to steal millions of dollars by just calling a single function. And that was very scary because if detection, finding this vulnerability is just the first step, right? Ex successfully retrieving the funds and returning it to the investors is another step. And it, it turns out it's harder than it sounds because if they try to make this function call and they send it to a mempool, given the high rewards, right? Bot botters, MEV bots would, would would see this transaction and front run them. And with so much at stake, they had to, they actually had to call up a few people, call up a few of their networks and, um, f and find some validator to build an entire block without ever sending it to a mempool. So this is a very interesting story. Uh, we might be able to get back to it at the end if there's time. So, so now that I've covered the basics of blockchain technology and, and how all the different components come together, uh, it's time to talk about decentralized finance or an application of the blockchain technology. So, yeah, so with finance, you need to have an exchange, right? If not, yeah, you need an exchange where you can exchange assets. So, the idea is that, um, so usually if you want to buy stocks, right, you send it to, you send it to uh, Robinhood or you send it to Tiger Trade. And what they'll do is they'll collect all the, they collect all the buy and sell orders and they'll match it up. They'll, they'll, they'll match it up like, it's called an uh, order, order book or order flow kind of. Uh, order, order, order book model where, where they'll match the buy and sell orders and then they'll earn a bit of profit by, 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 by taking a bit of commission. Um, that, that, that means that if you send a buy order but no one's willing to sell you or if you send a sell order and no one's willing to buy it from you then the transaction doesn't get fulfilled. So that's centralized exchanges but for decentralized exchanges the idea is that instead of having a order book model right you you have an idea of a liquidity pool. And so essentially, let's say I want to start my first decentralized exchange. What I will do as a first funder of this decentralized exchange is I would put two assets of equal value in that pool and allow anyone to trade with it. So for example, if I think Ether one Ethereum is worth 2,000 USDT, USDT is just USD tether, right? USDT is just tagged to the US dollar. It's a cryptocurrency that's tagged to the US dollar. So if I think one Ethereum is, one Ether is uh, worth 2,000 USDT, I'll put these two assets in the pool and I'll say, okay, now everyone, you can come trade with it how, how you wish. And um, I put it in this ratio because I believe the price is, 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 is according to this ratio. I believe that these two, uh, these two quantities are of equal value. And if, if I'm wrong, then people would come and, and, and people would think I'm giving away free money and come and trade with it. Right? But anyone else who wants to deposit uh, liquidity into this pool, we need to deposit in the same ratio, for example, 2,000, 2, 2 ETH to 4,000 USD. 
And so that's how you fund the liquidity pool. You put assets in some ratio of 50-50 value. Then that determines the price, right? That also determines the price of the, of, the, of the two assets. And how does trading occur? So assuming, so assuming, there's, uh, so assuming there's no liquidity, assuming there's no, fee, no, no, no trading fee collected, trading occurs by this constant product market maker formula. So what it does is essentially it says that anyone who comes along and makes a trade You'll need to keep they'll, they'll need to keep the product of the quantity of the two of the two assets the same. So if I plot x y equals to k, where k is some constant, right? I'll get this graph, this this uh this this kind of uh sloping, sloping graph, like kind of like a um yeah. I'll get this kind of graph. And let's say initially I was in this state. Initially I had this amount of token A and this amount of token B. Then if somebody else wants to come along and make a trade, they would. Let's say they want to put in some amount of token A to retrieve some amount of token B. So they would put in some amount of token A. Let's say this amount that they put in. So you move to the right here. And so how much token B do they get? They get it by vertically projecting this point down to the curve. So you can see that how the market maker formula works, how the constant product market maker formula works is that uh, traders will come along. They can, they can deposit assets, and but, but the state the the, the 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 red dot over here, the state of the liquidity pool will always move along the curve. It doesn't move, it, it always move along the curve. So this also has scarcity naturally, naturally baked, baked into it. So you can see that first of all, the price, the price that somebody we, we somebody manages to trade is the ratio of the amount of A they input over the amount of B they get. So essentially it's the gradient, the, the price is the gradient of the line passing through these two points, right? So, based on that definition, there's a few observations you can make. Number one is that if, if, uh, if the amount of tokens they trade is small compared to the liquidity pool, right, then the two points over here are very close together. And so the price is roughly picking the gradient of, 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 of the curve. Uh, another observation you can make is that if, if they make large trades, then they affect the price. Let's so say we move from here to here, you can see that the price changed because the gradient changed. And for scarcity, if let's say somebody made a trade that made this point very far up top here, then you can see that the gradient is super, super steep. And that means the price is very steep also. And that makes sense because if somebody moves the trade, move, move this red point, move the state of the liquidity pool all the way up here, that means there's very little token A and there's a lot of token B, right? And, and, and hence, the, the, the price of A to B will be very high. So this is the, this is the idea where, this is how we can use the math to, to facilitate trading without needing to have an order, order book kind of matching buy and sell orders. So this is known as an automated market maker formula, right? where, we use, where we use math to automate this trading. So how about trading fees? To incentivize people from depositing uh, assets into the pool in the first place to provide liquidity, to incentivize them, we will say that, okay, any trades will collect a small trading fee and this trading fee will be distributed among all liquidity providers in a fair way. So how that happens is that um, when you trade, let's say, let's say Zach trades with this liquidity pool. Instead of moving the point along the curve, he actually moves the point slightly upward. So the curve actually moves upward. And, 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 and if the curve moves outward, that means there's more assets being deposited in the pool. And this, this, this trading fee will be distributed equally among all uh, liquidity providers. So, um, how, so, so how we track this, how, how we make sure that the profit is equally split among everyone is we use the concept of a liquidity token. So you might heard of like, for example, for Uniswap, there's a Uni token, right? So what that is, is let's say I deposit uh, $1,000 $1, worth of assets into the pool, I get one Uni token. Then let's say my friend comes along and he deposits $2,000 worth of assets, he'll get two Uni token. And you see that the, the ratio of the, the amount of liquidity token I have divided by the total amount of liquidity tokens in circulation is the percentage I have of the pool. So if let's say I want to retrieve the money, I want to retrieve the liquidity they are provided and, and, and get some of the trading fees, I would, I would burn my liquidity tokens and retrieve the funds from the pool. So, so that's, that's how you incentivize liquidity providers from uh, putting in money in the first place. So that may seem like, wow, free money, right? Um, I, just, I just need to, if I have a lot of assets, I just park it in some liquidity pool and, 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 and collect fees and I win already. But 
uh, that it's not so simple. Number one is because actually nowadays there's a lot of crypto hacks. If you follow this website called Wrecked.News, you'll see that every other day there's, there's some major crypto hack. So if I put in $1 billion, then it gets hacked, then there's literally nothing I can do. And number two is uh, liquidity providers are also subject to something known as impermanent loss. So what that is, is uh, illustrated with this example, where let's say initially I deposit 2 ETH and 4K USDT. So the amount of assets, the value of the assets I own or deposited is 8K USDT. Then let's say some trading happens. Let's say the, the fees are negligible compared to, 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 the, to the, let's say the fees are negligible first. Right? Then if let's say the price of ETH changed after a while, uh, yeah, you can see the price double. Then the total, if you know, I calculate the total amount of value I have is 16K USDT. And that may seem like, wait, didn't I seem to gain value? I seem to double the amount of value. But you realize that if I had just kept my 2 ETH and 4K USDT, then actually the total amount of, if I didn't deposit into the liquidity pool and it didn't get traded around, I would actually have 20K USDT worth of assets. So this calculation shows that by taking my assets and putting in this liquidity pool, I've actually made I actually made a loss of 4K USDT. And, um, and it's called impermanent because if I don't withdraw the money, right, and I wait until the price returns back to the original price, then I wouldn't make this loss. So it's similar to how you, when you trade stocks, you have unrealized price, un unrealized uh, loss or gains, right? unrealized profits. Where if you, if you do not, if you do not, uh, with, if you do not uh, withdraw, with, you do not trade the stock after the price has moved, you do not realize those gains. So likewise, impermanent loss is impermanent because if you do not, if you do not make the trade after the price has moved, you wouldn't actually incur this loss. That's why it's called impermanent. So this example might be a bit confusing, but I think the intuition, there's a simple intuition for why people make impermanent loss. And that's because, and, and that's uh, due to the idea that when I want to deposit liquidity into this pool, I need to put assets of equal value. And let's say I want to deposit ETH and USDT, so I'll need to obtain ETH and USDT, right? So when I obtain ETH, I'm actually, I'm actually so-called investing in ETH, right? I'm actually investing in ETH itself by, 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 by buying the ETH. So liquidity providers, they cannot just deposit the assets because the impermanent loss is due to the fact that they're actually kind of investing. They're also kind of investing in the asset itself. And you can see that, so if I, if I, let's say I buy some ETH and buy some USDT and I deposit in some liquidity pool, if the price of ETH drops, then my, my so-called investment in ETH has, has lost in value. But let's say, and, and that, leads to, that leads to a loss of, that, that leads to an impermanent loss. But let's say, I, let's say the price of ETH increases. What will happen is that people will see, hey, this guy in the liquidity pool is providing free money, right? It's, it, they're providing ETH at a lower price, and they'll trade it with the liquidity pool, and I would be unable to, to realize my gains in, in the increase in price of ETH. So, this graph over here shows the impermanent loss as a function of uh, the, cha the change in price. So you can see that the only way I do not incur impermanent loss is if the price stays exactly the same, right, which will be a bit relevant later. The only way I do not incur, incur impermanent loss is if it stays the same. If it moves in any direction, right, I actually make impermanent loss. And so um, this, this kind of discourage, or this, this, this reduces the benefits that liquidity providers uh, have by depositing liquidity because uh, they may be able to gain some amount in trading fees, but if the price moves too much, then they actually make the impermanent loss will exceed the profit that they gain from the trading fees. So that uh, that might discourage liquidity providers from depositing liquidity in the first place. So the solutions to this is um, for well, one solution to this is only let people trade coins which have stable price. For example, stable coins, right? USDT and USDC. So if you only allow trading between stable assets, then the price wouldn't change much and, and, and it's more or less, uh, the impermanent loss is negligible. Another way is, so, so that's, that's the solution that Curve implements. Another th possible solution is let people deposit um, the liquidity in different ratios. Instead of having 50%, 50-50 in terms of value, you can deposit 10% and 90%. So that's what Balancer does. How exactly they do this is a little bit more complicated. Um, or another solution is another type of, is to use a different formula. Just not use x y equals to k, right? But nobody said we have to use that formula. We can, as long as the formula can capture the notion of scarcity, and and uh, and as long as the formula can capture the notion of scarcity, you can use that formula. So, for example, stable swap uses uh, a curve that looks something like that. So your original 
x y equals to k, Uniswap v1 curve is the purple curve. If you use a constant price, it's the red curve. But you can see the stable swap is like this, and you can see that the gradient, the gradient of the stable swap uh, formula is a lot more constant near these regions, right? Only when you move to the extreme ends, then the, the price really starts to uh, get quite extreme. So th those are so solutions. Uh, other notable features, these are not solutions to impermanent loss. Other notable features are concentrated liquidity. So just now I explained Uniswap V1, which is the XY equals to K. That's just a simplified, that's the first, that's the first uh, decentralized exchange. But over time, technology get more complicated, get, get more advanced, and, and people come up with uh, new technologies and fascinating ways to let people stick and trade. So for example, there's one idea of concentrated liquidity, which actually increases your permanent loss, your impermanent loss. But uh, concentrated liquidity also allows you to, to let your, to, to earn higher fees. Um, yeah, but I won't talk too much about that. Okay, so now, now we'll talk about decentralized finance. We can start talking about MEV. So MEV historically is called minor extractable value, but nowadays it's actually called uh, maximal extractable value because there's, we, minor refers to proof of work, but nowadays we move to proof of stake. So now in this case, MEV stands for maximal extractable value. So the idea is that, um, the, the idea is similar to traditional finance where if you have, so, so everyone can deploy their own uh, decentralized exchanges, right? So let's say you have two decentralized exchange trading the, the, the same pair of assets. Then if there's a difference in price between the two decentralized exchanges, somebody can, can buy from one and sell at the other. So you, you can perform this arbitrage and, um, by, and essentially you, you, you perform this arbitrage until the prices are equal, then the arbitrage, the arbitrage opportunity is not there anymore. And this allows you to gain a huge profit. And maybe wondering what, what exactly is a source of this profit and the answer is market inefficiencies. So, yeah, so, so here's an example of someone who, who, who gained $40,000 by, by performing arbitrage. So the nice thing about decentralized finance is unlike centralized finance, traditional finance, where everything is behind closed doors and legal barriers, right? Decentralized finance is very democratizing because anyone, anyone can just see the arbitrage transactions. You can see that this guy, they, they did a series of transactions over here and yeah, and, 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 they, and they gained money. So you can, anyone can just open Etherscan and analyze what, what arbitrage, uh, what arbitrage examples, analyze arbitrage examples. So yeah, so, so that's the idea of arbitrage. Okay, so where, where does the source of, when, when somebody performs the arbitrage trade, who are they earning from, right? And the, the answer is that they're they are earning from market inefficiencies. And market inefficiencies are created when users make bad trades. So for example, why the arbitrage opportunity will even exist in the first place is because someone came along and traded with one of the pools that moved the price of that pool, but he didn't trade with the other pool. So if the user came along and actually split this trade up to trade among both pools in a certain ratio, then the price would be, would, would be the same afterwards. So Fundamentally, arbitrage opportunities come from users making bad trades, and um, and, and 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 actually that's that's a lot more common than you think because most of us who, who first dive into like uh, cryptocurrencies, we just open MetaMask and kind of any out click, we don't really know what's going on, and that creates a lot of uh, arbitrage opportunities for 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 the market. So if that if somebody had come along and split up the, the the trade across multiple pools, then there wouldn't be this opportunity anymore. And the solution is that. How, how do I know to trade among multiple pools? Uh, isn't that like very complicated? I need to do a bit of math. I just want to trade my coins, right? How, 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 do I, how do I do this? The answer is to, instead of sending my transaction to, the, to, the, to one of the exchange, I send it to something known as a router. So I send it to the router, and essentially the router will help me make multiple trades. They'll help me calculate the best route. And how the router works is also uh, a bit involved, but they'll help you do the trade behind the scenes. And you see that this example of a transaction that the router made, right? the router made all these transactions, it interacted with a bunch of exchanges, it interacted with uh, uh, another router actually, yeah, it, it, inter it made a bunch of transactions instead of just making one transaction with, the, with, the, with one exchange. So that's, that's one way that, uh, that's, what, that's one way to, to reduce, to reduce uh, uh, the creation of arbitrage opportunities. So you, you saw something just now, which is that we had a bunch of these 
internal transactions. So I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about it. So, so just now you saw a list of transactions, right? Those are known as internal transactions. And what they are is their function calls between from, from one contract to another contract. So let's say, okay, so initially you send a transaction, right? Um, you, you send a transaction to the, to the contract, then the contract itself would make a bunch of function calls, just like how a, you know a function can call other functions many times. Right? So that, that, that one function will make function calls to many other functions, and each of those uh, function calls will result in an internal transaction. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is because contracts, smart contracts are useful if you're developing your own bot. And the reason is because um, you can essentially bundle many transactions into one. So especially in the context of arbitrage, right? what you do is you actually take out a flash loan to, to perform the arbitrage. And, and if you didn't take out a flash loan, you need, it would mean that you need to own so much assets to actually move the price. Right? And, and that's, that's a huge investment for anyone. So um, contracts allow you to, 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 I'll talk about flash loans later, but contracts al essentially allow you to, to make multiple mini transactions within one transaction. Uh, and the word internal is a misnomer because it sounds like the internal is like nobody can see, but actually that's, that's false. You can see just now, clearly I can see all the internal transactions that someone made. And uh, in fact, bots are becoming increasingly sophisticated that they can actually read the internal transactions and, and they can even replicate your, your transactions, your internal transactions. Okay, so just now we talked about arbitrage. That's, the most, uh, that's, that's one of the most uh, obvious forms of uh, MEV. Another way is known as slippage or sandwich attacks. So just now, arbitrage, what happens is that you, you, just now what arbitrage happens, how arbitrage works is that a user makes a transaction and then we back run it. Immediately after it makes a transaction, I put it right behind it. There's also front running where if a user is gonna make a profitable transaction, I, I make transaction first. I increase the gas fee, so I front run him and my transaction gets processed first and then I, I, I steal the profitable transaction, right? If you put both of these together, you can, there's something known as a sandwich attack, which, Attacks slippage. So what, how, how slippage works is, if a user wants to make a, a, a transaction, uh, okay, if a user wants to trade with a decentralized exchange, instead of saying, I'll make this trade exactly at this point in time, what they'll say actually is that, they actually tell the, the they actually tell, if you look at the contract, they actually tell the decentralized exchange, I want to make the trade within this price range. So let's say Ethereum is $2,000, I'll tell, uh, I'll tell the exchange, exchange that I want to trade it within 1.9k and let's say 2.1k. And, and what sandwich bots will do is they'll see this transaction and they'll say, oh, this guy is actually willing to buy at 2.1k. So they'll, they'll, first, they'll first front run me to buy, to, 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 to buy Ethereum to drive up the price until it's exactly 2.1k and then I buy at 2.1k and then after that, they'll sell it. So because after I buy, I actually increase the price slightly more. When they sell it, they actually make a profit. So if let's say I was willing to pay 2.1k for a 2k asset, uh, if someone sandwich, if somebody sandwiches me, they will actually essentially they will essentially earn the $100 from me. So there's a bit of calculations you do you need to do as a as a if you are a botter. Uh, but but this this is this is one type of opportunity. So with that, uh, we talk about flash loans. So when performing arbitrage. When performing front running, uh, oh sorry, when performing back running arbitrage, you 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 want to move the price of the you want to move the price of the the asset, and and usually the liquidity pools are huge, so it's a bit it's a bit difficult to to fund so much money because it's quite a high risk. Like if you make a mistake in your contract, right, you send it to the wrong address or something, you actually lose a lot a lot of money. So so, but flash loans changes this because flash loans essentially allow you to take out loans without any collateral. So how that happens is. You take out the loan within one internal transaction, right? One mini transaction. You do whatever you want with it, and then you return the loan in another internal transaction. And this entire bunch of internal transactions is all packaged together as one transaction. And so the person who loans you the money, they don't see a difference, right? They see you borrow the loan and return it immediately. So the entire transaction where you the other entire transaction where you take a loan, you do arbitrage, and then you, you return the loan, the entire transaction is atomic. So it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be a case where you take the loan and you run away with it because the entire transaction fails uh, if that's the case. So, so this, is, this is a technique that is, this flash loan isn't something that you see in traditional finance and it's used to carry out arbitrage attacks. Uh, and it's quite, it's quite a powerful tool. Okay, so now, now we'll talk about some basic uh, arbitrage opportunities. I would like to discuss the social and economics of it. So, so MEV seems like a good way to earn money. But what, what, 
what problems does it create for society? So number one, it leads to high gas fees. If 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 some NFT drops and then everyone's racing, all the bots are racing to it, then then that makes the network a bit unusable. Because, because you need to wait very long for your transactions. Alright? It might even okay, so another big so that's just that's just a like user experience problem, right? Not a, maybe not that huge. But another big red flag is that uh, MEV can lead to centralization. And I'll discuss that shortly. Um, yeah, so, so big, uh, the cryptocurrency people or crypto people, the whole point of blockchain is to decentralize, right? So, so the, the second point causes a lot of concern for, for, for all the crypto people. So, um, yeah, so there's this idea called flash bots, which sounds similar to flash loans because it sounds like you write a bot to use a flash loan, but actually it's a completely different concept. So, it, flash bots is a research organization that has a few products. And one of them is MEV Share, where essentially, if your user, if your user, instead of sending it to the Ethereum endpoint, they send it to the Flashbots endpoint. Then what happened is that Flashbots would 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 af after the bots get some of the MEV, they actually return it to the user. Um, so that's one way to possibly uh, increase increase user satisfaction, right? By using MEV Share, that's one of the products of Flashbots. Another product is the Flashbots Protect, which prevents you from being front run, but uh, the Efficient, the efficacy of that is, is, uh, is also a subject of debate. Uh, but the main, the main goal of Flashbots is to democratize MEV. And, and this, the, the, the product that they have for doing so is known as MEV Boost. And it's the implementation of this, known as, this thing known as PBS. So now I'll spend some time talking about, PB, about MEV Boost and PBS. So if you guys didn't know, the, the Ethereum blockchain used to be proof of work. Right? And then after that, they, they move it to proof of stake. So this movement was called the, the merge. So before the merge, when Ethereum was proof of work, what happened was uh, the mining pools actually got quite concentrated. And that's a big concern because if, because if, if, I, if as a MEV bot, right, I, I send a bundle that, uh, that, 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 that if, I, if I try to send a transaction that extracts MEV, then one of these mining pools, they'll see the profitable transaction, then they'll just be like, wait, why not I just replicate it myself, right? Because I'm actually the one producing the blocks. So they'll be like, hey, I can just copy it, I can just steal the MEV. And that leads to, that, that leads to centralization because if the mining pools can extract MEV very easily, then they can tell people, uh, join our mining pool and we'll distribute this MEV among you. So it leads to, it leads to centralization because the, the mining pools which have a lot of, which generate the blocks, they, they, they can incentivize more people to join their mining pool by saying we split this MEV equally among you. And that's, that's very bad because um, centralization is, is, it goes against the whole premise of DeFi uh, and, and blockchain technology. So the solution was to democratize MEV by adding this relay. So the idea is that the relay, which is run by Flashbots, would have a tr list of trusted mining pools and they tell them, the mining pools will be like, okay, we promise we don't, we promise we don't steal your MEV, right? Then, the MEV searcher will send the, the, the MEV transactions to this MEV relay, and the relay will forward it to them, and, and, uh, and, and the MEV searchers can incentivize the mining pools from running their bundles by including a bit of bit, a, a bit of extra tip, right? And, and uh, the idea is that this MEV relay would, would share the, the profits equally among the trusted mining pools and MEV searchers. So this way, if you, in this case, if you want to run if you want to extract MEV, you do not need to own the entire mining pool, right? And that allows anyone who wants to search for MEV, anyone who wants to extract MEV and do arbitrage from just being able to connect to this relay, and it lowers the barriers to entry. And if you lower the barriers to entry, you get more competitors, and, and that democratizes MEV. So this is before the merge. After the merge, um, instead of being a mining pool, right, instead of mining, you actually have validators. So. Uh, this this also led to centri this this also had a problem because uh, if because the, the the way the validators work is that they are randomly selected right so in order for one of the validators if one of the validators was selected they can do the arbitrage opportunity they can they can send they can send bundles but the chances of each validator individually having the opportunity to 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 do, carry the arbitrage is quite low so it encourages. Um, once again, similar to mining pools, encourages grouping together into staking pools. And so the solution to that was 
was PBS with a trusted relay. So the idea is that uh, your the idea is that now your validators they can optionally choose to run the MEV boost program, which communicates with the MEV relay. And what the MEV relay would do is that they would collect they'll collect blocks and and the tips from MV searchers, and they'll forward it to the validators. But when they forward it, they only send the header information, meaning they do they do not send they do not send uh, all the they do not send the main body of the of the of the arbitrage opportunity. So they do not send they do not send alpha, what we call alpha. They do not send like precious information that the validators can just replicate by themselves. And so the validators they wouldn't see the juicy MEV and they'll they'll just sign it, they'll collect the bit, right, as a small reward, and they'll just sign it and send it back to the relay. And the relay would then the relay having known the full block, they'll they'll sign because the validator signed the headers, the relay would, would send the full block and sign the, the full block on behalf of the validators and then send it to the rest of the network. And this way, the, the validators cannot uh, they cannot they cannot send they cannot send the full block with, with other with other transaction data. They cannot steal the MEV because if they tried to do so, then the network will see hey, you sign two different blocks and the, the validators will get slashed for it. They'll they'll lose their stake. So this is a solution, but you can see that so, so with this system, you must think of economic incentives. So if you're the validator, what's in it for you to run the MEV boost program to communicate the relay? What's in it for you is that you wouldn't need to work so hard to, to, to search for your own MEV, right? Because if, if you download the MEV boost program and you, and you communicate the relay, the relay will give you bits. The, the relay will give you uh, bits that, that come from the MEV. And yeah, so, so the validators have a reason to download MEV boost and run it. Instead of just instead of just uh, trying to carry out MEV themselves, and on top of that, this also lowers the barrier to entry for MEV. So to to be a validator, right? If, if, if you any anyone who takes thirty two ETH can be a validator, and they can easily download MEV boost and, and and be part of the MEV ecosystem. So this lowers the barrier to entry because the validators don't need to be don't need to be specialized in analyzing market inefficiencies and all that. And they don't need to think very hard. They just need to download take the ETH, download the program, and now they, can be, now they can take part in this ecosystem. And that, once again, lowers the barrier to entry. And the validators, there'll, there'll be a lot more validators competing with each other. Uh, and that prevents centralization. So the problem with this setup is that this PBS, right, proposal builder separation just refers to, proposal refers to, uh, proposal refers to the validators, and builders refer to the, the block builders, the MEV searchers. So you, sep you see the relay separates the validators and the, the, the searchers. And, and the problem with this is that there's no one, there's, there's actually no incentive for the relay to, to, to be run, right? The relay itself is actually run by flashbots because they have, uh, it's, it's the relay is essentially a public good, right? The relay is, is run by flashbots because flashbots wants the entire community to thrive. But I myself, as an independent actor, I wouldn't want to download this relay because I'm just wasting computing power. So this, this, this is not bad, but the relay still needs to be a public good which is which is not ideal so uh, there's a proposal for in protocol PBS where um, it is it's an improvement that's coming to Ethereum soon mm -hmm. and essentially it allows you to have PBS without the need for a relay so when but, but there's still a lot of open questions and, and debate about it and you can see the if, if you if you browse to this website you can see the entire debate about about uh, in protocol PBS and um, yeah so all these are still hot topics of research um, yeah. So whenever discussing, whenever we discuss MEV, usually the people at Ethereum Research, what they'll do is they they they'll consider a bunch of social factors and and um and the topics for discussion are usually avoiding centralization. So we're actually seeing more and more high frequency trading firms like like Jump Trading, right? They're actually entering this this uh this MEV market. So that's ideally we sh we should still be able to. Ideally, the ecosystem should still allow small time actors like solo searchers to. To, to join the market, if not, if not, centralization might lead to bad outcomes. And uh, in in a rare in a rare case, in an extreme case, um, people instead of people rearranging transactions, they might actually rearrange entire blocks, which might lead to uh, which, which might lead to destabilization of the entire Ethereum network. So that's that's also another uh, area of concern. And lastly, most more more importantly, whenever you design solutions for MEV. 
you need to consider aligning everyone's economic incentives. So you cannot, you, you want a trustless protocol where you do not need to trust anyone uh, to play their part. You can, you, you want a trustless protocol where everyone is naturally incentivized by their own selfish reasons to, to play their own part. And, and that's, um, yeah, and that's the economics aspect of it. So, yeah, so, so that's about all I have for today. Uh, thanks. Okay, so now we're open for Q&A. I mean, you can scan this QR code, or you can use the link on the whiteboard here and there and here, or you can just ask your question directly. So, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you for the insightful talk. So actually, I'm interested in a lot of the same things as you, like regarding arbitrage, right? But then I noticed in your, your profile, right, there's a quite a fancy sounding phrase. Can you find it? Uh, Cross-chain long-tail market inefficiency. So I was curious as to what that means. So okay, that, that's a great question. So um, so right now, so far, the, the MEV opportunities are described is it's within Ethereum itself, like the arbitrage or the, the sandwich is within one chain. But cross-chain basically refers to opportunities that occur, occur across different chains. So for example, the, if Uniswap not only exists on Ethereum blockchain, it also exists on like Polygon or like uh, Arbitrum. So you have one exchange or many exchanges that's, that's, distribu that's distributed or deployed on different chains, different blockchains. And, and um, and that leads to a few, a few complications because uh, you need to, if you want to extract these opportunities, you need to kind of be able to co coordinate the arbitrage across different chains. And so, so yeah, so that's roughly what cross chain refers to, arbitrage opportunities across different chains. And long tail refers to more niche opportunities. So short tail roughly, all the arbitrage and sandwiching is quite well known, like it's, it's well known among everyone because it's available widely on the internet. Uh, and that leads to a lot of competition. So usually the ones who win arbitrage opportunities are those with a lot of resources, for example, high frequency trading firms. Uh, whereas long tail, so, so short tail, short tail refers to like high volume, very commonly known uh, MEV opportunities. Whereas long tail refers to more niche ones where maybe you need to dig around the internet and you need to think quite hard by yourself to, 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 to find these long tail opportunities. So long tail is more suitable for uh, like solo searchers or small teams, whereas short tail is 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 more for those big companies where or big teams where they have they have like nodes deployed all around the world where they can actually scout these mempool transactions and 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 compete at a much uh, faster rate. Yeah, and and since you mentioned you're interested, uh, yeah, if 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 you want to discuss more, you can drop me a text on Telegram. We can have a nice discussion. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a great question. So, um, so as a user, at the moment, what you can probably do best is uh, that you can probably just you can probably send your transaction to MEV Share or, or Flashbox. Okay, so there's there's MEV Share, which if you send your transaction to it, they would return you a bit of the MEV that has been extracted from your transaction, right? Of course, they'll share it a bit with the MEV searchers to incentivize them. But if you send your MEV Share, they'll return a bit of it to you. Uh, for MEV, or Flash Bros Protect is more for front running, right? Uh, it doesn't really protect you against arbit arbitrage after like back running, um, and yeah. So so I would say may maybe send your transaction to MEV Share, and uh, another way is uh, on a more systemic level, on a more ecosystem level. Right now, there's discussions of how how you can essentially have MEV Share, but but baked into baked into like the ecosystem itself. So. In the in the far future or in the near future, where in the ideal future, right? Uh, you know, like how how if you use some credit card, you get rebates, right? So so that could be something we see in in the uh, decentralized finance. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah. 